In this video, I will give an overview of the national systems in Compute Canada. We have several major HPC clusters in Canada, and to use any of these clusters, you need a Compute Canada account. We're using exactly the same credentials, username and password, on all Compute Canada national systems. Iputus is perhaps the oldest system in Compute Canada. It's been in production since September 2016, and it is a cloud system. What this means is on Ibutus, you would launch virtual machines and inside a virtual machine, you can install your own operating system. It could be any variant of Linux, could be Windows, and then you are the owner of that virtual machine and you are the administrator, so you have proof access to the machine and you can install any software you want. So this is a cloud environment and it is very different from traditional HPC systems. Of course, we have also traditional HPC systems where you can, will compute on bare metal without visualization. And we have three general purpose clusters, CEDAR at SFU, Graham at the University of Waterloo, and Beluga at McGill University. I'm gonna talk about the detailed specs of these systems in the next few slides. Uh, what I wanna mention here is that general purpose systems are meant for any type of uh, computational workflow. So it could be running serial jobs, could be running a large number of serial jobs, could be uh, small shared memory jobs, could be large distributed memory jobs that you can run on multiple nodes on the cluster, could be GPU jobs, any combination of the uh, job types I just mentioned, etc. We also have a, a large system, Niagara, at the University of Toronto that's been in production for the past two years. And Niagara is different from the general purpose clusters in that it only allows very large jobs. So on Niagara, you can schedule uh, resources by node and a node is 40 cores. So the smallest job you can run on Niagara will be 40 cores. So Niagara is really meant as, as a cluster for large parallel jobs. Uh, this slide shows you a brief, it's a brief overview of the resources you will find on a cluster. When you log into a, an HPC cluster, you will find yourself on a login node. Uh, sometimes it's called, it's called a head node. And a login node is really meant as a gateway to the cluster. Once you are on the login node, you have access to the Linux shell on that node, to the file systems, and then you can compile your codes, you can prepare data, uh, input data for, uh, for your large jobs. Uh, you can uh, schedule jobs from the login node. Uh, you can view results of, uh, of your uh, large simulations. So the login node is shared among many users and it's not really meant for anything CPU intensive. Uh, if we find that you're running anything CPU intensive on the login node, uh, we'll contact you and we'll ask you not to do that. To run anything CPU intensive or large memory jobs uh, or GPU intensive, you really have to submit a job to one of the compute nodes. And on the cluster, we have several hundred or several thousands of compute nodes. And each compute mode is essentially a large, a big server. Uh, each compute node has typically several dozen CPU cores, several dozen processors, and then some large amount of memory. So a typical configuration, for example, on CETA, a node has 128 gigabytes of memory and 32 processing cores. Uh, so we have several hundred or several thousand such nodes on a cluster. And then uh, on each cluster, we have several parallel file systems. These file systems are typically mounted uh, both on the login and compute nodes. And these file systems are actually quite different from a standalone SSD or hard drive on a laptop in that they were specifically designed for large scale workflows. That means that they typically very good for storing very large files or for doing very large um, IO. So if you have a lot of data that you're writing into a file, you can actually write it in parallel and that will speed up uh, your writing process. And the same for parallel read as well. Uh, on the other hand, these parallel file systems are usually quite bad when it comes to uh, small IOs uh, to large number of files. And for that reason, and I'll mention it many times in, uh, in this course, we really discourage people from storing a large number of files 
in their directories. Uh, this slide shows the specs of the general purpose, um, general purpose clusters, CEDA, Graham, and Beluga. And as you can see, these are quite heterogeneous clusters. So CEDA is the uh, largest one, uh, more than 90,000 CPU cores. And uh, first, when it came into service uh, three years ago, uh, it had only one type of uh, processor and subsequent expansion phases added uh, Skylake and uh, Cascade Lake processors to it. So now we actually have a large collection of heterogeneous nodes. Uh, the base nodes uh, on CEDA have 128 gigabytes of memory and 32 cores. So that means that effectively you have four gigabytes of memory per core. And then we have a number of other larger memory nodes up to three terabytes. And this is useful uh, having these large uh, memory nodes actually allows computational workflows where you have a shared memory job that for some reason requires a lot of memory. So a typical example will be a job in bioinformatics. Uh, a lot of bioinformatics codes were written for shared memory and they assume a lot of memory. So if you submit a large memory job, it will typically go to one of these uh, large memory nodes. In addition to uh, the uh, base nodes and to the large memory nodes, we also have GPU nodes on, on CEDA. And uh, these have a variety of GPUs. So starting from uh, P100 Pascal GPUs and to the more, uh, more modern uh, V100 voltage GPUs. Uh, and if you have a job that requires uh, some rendering on, on a GPU, or perhaps you need to do some computing on a GPU, and a lot of modern codes, uh, they make use of CUDA and OpenCL, and uh, they can actually run, they can offload some computations onto GPUs, you can run these jobs on CEDA. Uh, the specs on Graham and Beluga are quite similar. Uh, so this table shows you that Graham is smaller, it's roughly half the size of uh, CEDA, and Beluga is uh, the most recent addition to our Compute Canada cluster family, so 35,000 uh, CPUs roughly. Uh, both Graham and Beluga have uh, large memory nodes and they have uh, GPU nodes as well. As I mentioned previously, Niagara is slightly different in that it is meant for large scale uh, large-scale parallel jobs, so the smallest amount of computation you can ask for on Niagara is 40 cores, a single node. So Niagara has uh, about 80,000 CPU cores, and it is hosted at the University of uh, Toronto by Cynet. About 20% of resources uh, in Compute Canada are uh, the, default, uh, the default queues. We call them rapid access service. So that means that when you have a Compute Canada account, you can log in to any of the classes that I mentioned before, and you can start submitting jobs. And your jobs will run in the default allocation, the default queues. So roughly 20% of the cluster is dedicated to these, uh, these computations. We also have uh, many large groups in Canada, research groups uh, that require more computing. So typically that means either more than 50 CPU years of computing in one academic year, or more than 10 GPU years of computing in one, uh, one year. And if you require such resources, then you will need to submit a RAC application. RAC stands for Resource Allocation Competition. And uh, this competition happens once a year. So the deadline is usually in November, in the fall. And um, uh, several hundred people uh, submit applications and these are judged based on their scientific merit and uh, their technical expertise as well. And uh, typically we cannot give everybody all the resources they're asking for. So usually we scale the majority of applications by some factor. And uh, the graph on the two graphs on the right show you the requests in, in, in red versus the uh, allocations uh, that we can provide in yellow. So blue shows the total resources that we have as a function of time, and then yellow shows the allocation that, uh, that we can provide in the RAC queues. So as you can see, our resources are in very high demand. Uh, this year, 2020 RAC uh, allocations, we were able to provide only 30% of the CPU asks, only 26% of the GPU asks. And this year, we actually did not have enough storage to uh, 
satisfy all requests. So that means that we had to scale down all applications for storage space as well. So we could only provide 86% of the requested storage. There is a large gap between requests and, uh, and the resources that we have. And unfortunately, in the next year or two, uh, that's not going to change because we don't have any major funding for any new systems. We hope that two or three years down the road, that's going to change. But right now, for the next couple of years, we'll have to deal with the, this large gap in uh, between the requests and our capacity. Already mentioned that on the clusters, we have uh, several file systems. Uh, so the setup, both uh, the setup in terms of the file systems and the software setup on the uh, three major general purpose systems, Cedar, Graeme, and Beluga, is quite similar by design. And uh, this is done so that you can log into any system and you will find yourself, um, you will find exactly the same uh, tools that you are accustomed to using on another cluster. On all clusters, when you log in, you will find yourself in a your home directory. Uh, this is standard for any Linux system. And home directories have quotas. Uh, so that's 50 uh, gigabytes per user. On Niagara, it's slightly larger. And then it's not only the total amount of space, but it's also the number of files. So each user can have up to 500,000 files in their home directory. And this is done by design so that users don't end up storing millions and millions of files on this home file system. Because as I mentioned previously, a parallel file system uh, cannot handle a very large number of files very easily. So home is not really meant for storing large files. It is a system where you would typically store your configuration files, various text files, perhaps your source code. But if you're running the code that it is writing a lot of data, then uh, the best place to put the data will be the scratch file system. So scratch is forward, scra forward slash scratch forward slash your username on each system. There is also a symbolic link from home directory, and there is also an environment variable, dollar sign scratch, that can be used to access uh, this file system. Scratch has uh, more space. Uh, so the quota is 20 terabytes on Cedar, well, 100 terabytes on Graham, 25 terabytes on Niagara. I'm not quite sure what it is on Beluga, but it should be something similar to these numbers. So it's much, it's much bigger than uh, what you have in, in inside home. But Scratch is not, uh, does not have uh, enough space for everybody to suddenly dump 20 terabytes of data. So uh, the reason uh, why we uh, see that people can put 20 terabytes of data is that typically not all users store 20 terabytes at once. So if everybody starts doing that at once, then the file system will uh, get very quickly. So also to make sure that the file system has uh, some spare capacity, we have a purge policy and we ask people to remove files that are older than typically six weeks. So if you have some files that you've been keeping on the Scratch file system for longer than six weeks, we're going to contact you via email and tell you that you have these files that have been uh, on Scratch for, for a long time. Please move them somewhere else or we're going to delete them. We're going to send you a couple of reminders, but if you don't act on this, we're actually going to remove these files. So please keep in mind that there is a six-week policy, scratch policy on the Scratch file system, and we do enforce it. Unlike the whole home file system, which is backed up, Scratch is not backed up, so that is very important. Scratch is really meant as a short-term, very high-performing uh, Scratch file system for storing the uh, output of your simulation codes. For long-term storage, we have a project, which is a disk archival system. Uh, so it is, um, it is essentially a combination of SSDs and, and hard drives. And uh, you have, by default, you have one terabyte quarter, half a million files uh, in, in project. If you need more storage, then let us know. Typically, this is done via RAC, the RAC allocation competition that I mentioned uh, previously. And uh, uh, project is backed up. Uh, unlike, unlike the Scratch file system. But Project is not really a high-performing file system, so performance is medium. So that means that you should not really be dumping you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of output data from your simulation code. For that, please use the Scratch file system. We also have Neoline, which is tape archive, but it's not accessible by default. It is only available to you if you have an allocation on Neoline. And for that, uh, you can 
uh, go into um, the details of our rack process and uh, there you will see you can actually request some near line space. Finally, I want to mention local scratch, which is the highest performing file system of all of this. And local scratch is essentially a local SSD on each compute node. So each compute node will typically have a one terabyte or perhaps a two terabyte SSD uh, on the general purpose systems. And these SSDs are local to this compute node. So that means that the IO bandwidth reading and writing uh, to, this, uh, to this SSD is very high. But because this SSD is very small and because it's shared uh, among multiple users on the same compute node, we have to be very careful uh, so that we don't, uh, we don't fill it quickly. Uh, the way we do this is you can only write to this SSD from a compute job that is running on that compute node. So at runtime, once your job starts running, uh, there will be uh, inside your job, there will be a Sloom environment variable, Sloom team PDIR, which is gonna uh, point to a subdirectory on this local scratch. And there you can actually store uh, files, read and write files, but this directory will only exist for the duration of your job. Once your job gets killed or finishes, this directory will be deleted. So it is your responsibility to copy any important files out of the directory inside the job before this job finishes.